I put a block of metal. These beauty particles would be scattered all over the place. But no one even contemplated thinking that if you fired alpha particles at the block of metal, they would be scattered. And so Rutherford struck Marsden to work alongside Geiger and to see if any alphas were scattered by a block of metal. <coughs> this is Marsden's apparatus. The alpha emitter illuminating a, a block of metal here. If any was scattered on the same side, here was a scintillating screen. That would be a flash of light, and you'd observe the microscope and a lump of lead to make sure you cut out any of the lens. would go straight through. And Marsden could immediately report that yes, alpha particles were scattered by this block of metal. Even if this metal was a very thin film of metal foil, such as I was using it. It was forward scattered. Years later, the Rutherford was to say, it's as though you fired a 15-inch naval shell and a piece of tissue paper, and it bounced back and hit you. Uh, so this was something rather quite fundamental. And Geiger and Marsden uh, wrote this up. It took Rutherford two years before he explained this effect away. And initially I thought this was rather strange because he had already had the idea of that the atoms had to be in the seat of incredibly intense electric fields. But the answer was just so simple. There was just so much going on in the lab. There were all sorts of good stuff being looked at and all sorts of interesting results. So we'll just pause for a second and I'll cover just a couple of them as examples. Even back in Canada, Brother knew he wanted a detector of individual alpha particles if he was ever going to do things like absolutely quantify the strength of a radioactive source. If he was going to make measurements of fundamental quantities such as bolts and <coughs> Now, you could detect these high speed alpha particles, if you put them through a coil, there'd be a blip of electricity as this charged particle rocketed through, just, just through the change in the electromagnetic field. But it was down amongst the noise. However, he was an expert in gas conduction from his Cavendish days, at, and also in, in uh, Canada. And besides, his mate who worked alongside him in, in Cavendish had pointed out that an alpha particle left behind a trail of ionising rays, some 20,000 at least. And so here was the magnifying effect. So when Rutherford went here to Manchester, he built this device. Metal tube, insulation box either end so you could reduce the pressure inside here. Down the middle, a wire, very smooth, of known radius, and so, and then the voltage put between that wire and the outer case, such that the electric field at the surface of the wire was almost enough to rip the electrons off atoms and cause conduction, but not quite. It was primed, all set to go. And if you had an a, a alpha emitter down here, over the stop cock, it would come in. We're now with this trail of at least 20,000 from any single one of these ions. There'd be a pulse of electricity between these two. And that could be detected with an electrometer. Um, but more than that, you could use an optical lever to have a spot of light on it. You know, you should see these things here. The spot of light would go every time an alpha particle went through. And then where that was, you would have a strip of photographic paper and you could lower this just gently, and you ended up with a permanent record, and this thing would tirelessly collect this data. Whereas using the scintillation plate, you had about 15 minutes um, that you could do just by observing in the dark room. This device was the Rutherford Geiger tube. In 1913, Geiger went back to Germany, and a decade, two decades later, with a student, Muller, they produced the Geiger Muller tube. 
And this was much more effective for detecting the much weaker beta particles. But it relied on a very sharp point. And you had incredible electric fields from the sharp point, but it was a right pain on the backside because uh, this would be eroding away with the with the discharge, and you'd have to take that and sharpen the point. And, and we'll, if you go and take a modern guiding warmer tube and take a look inside, so here's the metal case, here's the internal wire, very smooth, now it's just connected one end, and this end is not a point, it's rounded to be the same radius of curvature as the rest of the wire, so the electric field at the surface was constant over the whole surface. The little plastic, uh, thin plastic that I haven't allowed any of the holes and beaters in has been taken away. Uh, that allowed the gas pressure to be reduced and so on. And so the modern Gliga Morbid tube is far closer to the Rutherford Gliga tube um, than the Gliga Morbid tube. <laughs> there have been seven Nobel Prizes awarded for detectors of ionising radiations. But there's never been one for the first of these, because just the year before, rather than the bit awarded the Nobel Prize um, in chemistry. Now, of the other sorts of work going on, um, at Chicago, Millikan was adapting the uh, charge cloud method to make a measurement on the actual charge on the el electron. And in writing up his work, he had reviewed all previous measurements and made up a table of the reputable ones just to check on the accuracy of everything. And here you see down here, here's the <coughs> value of the charge on the electron. And notice it's exactly the same value as what Brother and Geiger had already published on the charge on the electron through using their Rutherford Geiger tube. So it wasn't surprising that it took Rutherford two years before he went to Mars, uh, went to Geiger's room, and said, I know what the atom looks like, and sent Geiger off to make very accurate measurements of this large angle <coughs> scattering that was to confirm his theory. And this is a page from his notebook. The uh, atom wasn't the solid sphere where the electrons were embedded in it like plums and plum pudding. But instead, all of one charge had to be right in the centre there, a very tiny volume compared with the whole atom. And all of the mass had had to be in there. And if you fired alpha particles towards this uh, gold atom is a handy one. You can see out here there'd be deflections and you got your large angle scattering. But the one that was aimed right directly would have had a head-on collision with it. Notice it would come to a halt and then start going away again. <coughs> Be repelled. And this would cause this gold <coughs> atom to recoil back. And it was just a conservation of momentum. Now, this nuclear model of the atom is what Brother is internationally most famous for. And that work was done here, all right? But going back to the last diagram, you've got way inside the volume of an atom, but it still seemed to be a longish away from this very highly charged gold atom. And if you replace that with a, with a very small charged atom, hydrogen is the prime example, you can work out easily that uh, you fire the alpha in, the hydrogen nucleus is only a quarter of the mass, so it recoils with a speed that's 1.6 times that of the speed of the alpha particle going in. 
And because the hydrogen nucleus only half the charge of the incoming one, it's not scattered so much by the air and losing its charge. And it will travel four times the distance in the air that the alpha particle would. And so Rutherford was carrying out experiments like this, looking at this uh, recoil atom, and the uh, distance of recoil should depend on the mass. Um, hydrogen was the one where you got the four times as far as the alpha particle would go in air, the, the others less so. But <clears throat> what should have happened was that nitrogen being lighter than oxygen would travel further in the air than oxygen did. But rather than found curiously, they travelled about the same distance. 1913, Geiger went back to Germany and Marston then came back to Cavendish, took up Geiger's position, and rather than had him study the uh, alpha particle scattering and so on from hydrogen. 1914, this collaboration came to a halt because Marston accepted the job back in New Zealand that Rutherford got for him. And for Rutherford, it came to a halt because World War I started, and for the next couple of years, he was involved full time on war research. So Marston wrote up his. Uh, experience up to date, he knew he couldn't do any more in New Zealand, didn't have the facilities, and he made a statement that they were used to seeing these hydrogen nuclei recording, they were quite used to that, they would see it in all sorts of stuff, but things that should have had hydrogen in it, but you weren't sure whether it might have been some water impurity. Uh, <coughs> might have been some hydrogen contamination of the sample, all sorts of things. And Marsden thought it might even be a constituent of the alpha emitter was also giving out this, this uh, hydrogen nucleus. So there's a couple of years hiatus until 1917, um, they started setting up government laboratories to take over the, the war work that these academic scientists were doing, and so all the day-to-day -day stuff was being done by trained technicians and scientists. And rather than go back to his original um, researches, the labs were depleted, of course, there were no young men around, and so it was reasonably hard working on this, and Kay took a lot of the flack on having to do the counting of these experiments. And so Rutherford, by December of 1917, wrote to Niels Bohr and in this letter said, uh, we're we'll also trying to split up the atom using this method. Uh, please treat this as confidential, or as private. And somewhere along the lines, he was quite confident that he had actually split the atom. He never published until the war finished. Let's just have a...
But in particular, he noticed that when he changed his gases in this container and put in nitrogen, he saw a heck of a lot of these things at a greater distance than the others could possibly do it. Uh, and he wrote his papers up at the involving the collisions with uh, alphas with oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. And he's held off until after the war, and it was the time he was being transferred to the Cavendish lab to take over from JJ Thompson. He was retiring to become the Master of Trinity. And so the father of the electron handed over to the father of the nucleus. <coughs> and he, these four papers came out about this time of year, 1919. And scientifically, rather than receive quite a bit of kudos, the spikes in the number of honorary doctorates and things <laughs> really sparked just after this. It didn't create a great deal of interest in the public domain. It was a bit esoteric. <coughs> Oops. A, in late 1919, a French astronomer visiting England to look at the state of science. And he had an a interview with the Prime Minister and, and he visited Manchester and it was probably after one of them left for Cambridge. And in December of that year he wrote an article for the Matthew the newspaper, a tremendous discovery, transmutation. The Press Association picked this up and broadcast it, mainly through the American papers, and the same day in the American papers were all sorts of uh, headlines involving alchemists. Now, rather than this is the second time we've been called an alchemist, he wasn't all that comfortable with it. Um, when he and Solly first determined the, uh, a few of the steps of these radioactive decays, after Rutherford had already shown three steps from ray rayon emanation then a, uh, something that was metallic and heavy to sit down. He had Solly, being the chemist, to separate out his uh, radioactive solutions. And so one part had no radioactivity to it. And then over time, this built up in radioactivity. And that was the confirmation of the transformation. <coughs> and rather than uh, suddenly an old age recalled to his biography that uh, he, he said, or rather the report was going up and suddenly mentioned, oh, you know, we're, we're now alchemists. Rather said, don't call it alchemy because I will have a head to it. Now he had quite good reason to do that. The previous claimant to be the first successful alchemist was James Price, FRS in 1783. And he claimed to have produced gold from mercury. And no one could reproduce this. <coughs> and so three fellows of the War Society were sent to go and examine his techniques. And when they found out he had a false bottom in his crucible, he drank prussic acid and dropped dead in front of their eyes. <laughs> so it could be injurious to your health. <laughs> 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 By 1921, there was a lot of, again, this thinking on the bandwagon of alchemy. Uh, this had happened way back when Rutherford and Solly had first produced their theory. In fact, Ramsey was one of the worst. He claimed if you put radium emanation in with water, you got neon. And it took Rutherford and others to, to show that, that neon was just the natural component of air that was leaking into his system. He, he was a great chemist, but he was an appalling scientist. And so in 1921 it came up again that you could produce, you, you could use this to produce gold from mercury. And one German economist made a statement that Germany will pay its phenomenal war reparations that it was. Post on it by 
this technique. <laughs> By 1922, we had these sorts of headlines in an American magazine. Um, and I have, do have to emphasize that the title had really nothing to do with the article. The article was quite sound and sound. Um, but, you know, you might as well in for a penny, in for a pound. 1923, Rutherford was the president of the Royal of the uh, British Association for the Advancement of Science, meeting in Liverpool. And as usual, they made up a presidential banner. Most of it was the coat of arms of the port of Liverpool. And there's just one mention of Rutherford, and alongside it is the, a little bit of his background, the Maple Leaf of Canada, and the astronomical Southern Cross representing New Zealand. The students thought he should have a banner that more typified his discoveries, and so they made up a banner. <laughs> That's why I missed a slide. Transferred to the wrong. Uh, I had to drop a whole pile off this to make changes for reasons of you here know. Um, last. I will have to quickly skip through. I was going to talk about the copper report experiment saying I may not be around for that centennial in, in 2032. In 1971, the centennial of the birth of Rutherford, various countries put out stamps. They have a look at my Rutherford website. It gives a story to this, and it shows how New Zealand produced the stamp only because they had been shamed into it by Russia. They put out a stamp for his birthday. Everyone wonders why the New Zealand stamp came out at the end of the year rather than in August when Rutherford was born. The Russian stamp had a diagram from Rutherford's work in the uh, alpha scattering that led to the structure of the nucleus. Canada was starting to move into nuclear engineering in, in a big way, nuclear power plants and things. And the Canadian Post Office chose this artist's rendition because it was just so evocative. It was the energy of the in the nucleus and it's bursting out. Just so great for a stamp for this. Well, that's bollocks. <laughs> if you're as long on the tooth as I am, you remember that when helium ne neon lasers were first discovered, the first thing we did was shone them into a camera that had colour slide film. And that's where the beam hits just oversaturated so it's why it's white. And notice how these rays coming out as all sort of symmetric and that's just a fraction on the straight edges of the metal that makes up the iron <coughs> the camera to alter the amount of light going in and out. And so let's have uh, plenty of time if you want more detail. <coughs> it's in there. The book of the DVD, the three hour DVD, although the detail about this side of it, uh, I've found out much more about that since when I wrote my book, I just assumed that the people writing about Rutherford uh, who knew him would have it all right, but then I found out they never looked at archives or uh, records of the day and have, have it just from their own guesswork. Hmm. Right, so that's... to your reference to Rutherford showing that the recoil range of oxygen and nitrogen were anomalously the same. Yeah. I know that we've, over the email, um, a number of us have been talking about this. Um, and as you'll remember in the discussion of part four, 
he raises this again. He, he draws people's attention to the, the, the result that he, he first notes in part three. And there's one sentence where he actually he brings it, the, the, this anomalous recoil um, energy of the swift nudging. Um, and he says, if, you know, that, that if the two, if that's associated with the production of H atoms, then this might explain the anomalous energy. Um, now, uh, he's not actually saying that it's um, the anomalous nitrogen it is oxygen, but he, it appears to me that he has identified pretty accurately uh, that the the energy of the recoil atom um, is is op is the same as oxygen. And that, that is... Yeah, what he stated equivocally uh, in this paper 4 was that he had not... Uh, uh, the hydrogen nucleus had come out of the nitrogen nucleus and therefore was a component part of the nitrogen nucleus. He had split the atom and done transmutation and that produced hydrogen. Um, but from the other three pages where they talked about the range and they are about the same. Uh, you know, Nagy, you could say that he was, he was uh, on the board, but he never claimed it was oxygen. No, he never claimed that. But in that sentence in part four, yeah. it's almost as if he's, he's putting out an alternative to the disintegration. He, 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 he's saying that the recoil atom, the swift nitrogen, um, he's, uh, has, has the energy of, of, of oxygen. To the recoil, yeah. Uh, that, that wasn't in part four, that was when he was talking about oxygen and nitrogen. He, 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 okay, well, it, there is that one sentence in part four, but we'll, we'll discuss that. Yeah. Okay. I wondered if um, what he thought had happened to the alpha particle during that experiment. Uh, uh, he made the statement. And doing these, because a lot of these were the elf particles, just bounced off, you know, high, high scattering and so on. And he said the surprising thing is that the alpha particle had stayed whole, it wasn't broken up in that. Uh, and he could see that if they could generate high energy alpha particles, they could break up almost anywhere. I was wondering when, so following on from those experiments, when he either wrote or decided that the alpha particle was actually being incorporated into the nitrogen, as it were. And, uh, uh, now, what he knew is firing at the nitrogen and a hydrogen nucleus <coughs> came out, and it had to have been part of that, and the other bit. Uh, you know, you couldn't tell nitrogen from oxygen. So he didn't know whether it was a nitrogen in calling or oxygen. But he never made any comment about that. He was just adamant that A, the nitrogen nucleus contained a proton, and B, it was amazing that the alpha particle hadn't been split up in doing these experiments. It, it always just stayed the same being reflected, except in this case. Did he at any time, at any time prior to Blackett's experiments, consider that um, oxygen had been produced <coughs> uh, in no, this reaction? No, there was a did, he, did he wait until Blackett's experiment before he actually came up with that idea? Uh, that was the confirmation, but in 1921, Rutherford got a Japanese visitor to, to build a automated <coughs> to examine this, and then when he returned to Japan, the project was handed on to Blackett, and then he found through the automatic cloud chamber that uh, it was definitely oxygen that was produced. But no, he never made any great claim that oxygen was produced, all he'd done was produce hydrogen. I mean, the, the obvious thing, because what he says in his paper, which I just happen to have in front of me, is that the hydrogen atom which is liberated formed a constituent part of the nitrogen nucleus.
figures. Yeah. So, so you could say he imagined the alpha particle chipped a proton off. But that would, of course, have made carbon. Did he ever speculate that he made carbon in the experiment? Uh, not that I'm aware of. He, he then, uh, with all this alchemy and gold from mercury and all that, he kept a low profile while he's worked on it. Those sorts of problems he's trying to think about. It's not always mentioning, of course, that Rutherford, of course, he was an incredibly um, thorough guy, but he was pretty sure that disintegration was occurring back in, certainly back in 1970. And there's a, a quote that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, because he turned up late at a committee meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah, on submarine. Uh, uh, on war, and he apologised. I'm sorry, gentlemen, I'm, I'm late for the meeting, but I have evidence that uh, it might be possible to artificially dis disintegrate an atom. Yeah. And if that's true, it's far more important than the war. So <laughs> 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 that was reminiscent of one of the Americans at the meeting, uh, late in life. It's, so it's true, um, yeah, that's which might not be exact. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 I was going to have, come back into the discussion again. I, I, um, we, I agree that in the, in the, in the discussion of part, part four, the, the, the explanation appears muddled. That sentence I quoted about the anomalous uh, recoil energy um, uh, of the swift nitrogen atom, as he calls it, um, having the equivalent to, to oxygen, is, is, is almost if he's putting it for an alternative to the disintegration. Uh, idea. Um, but that concept of disintegration continued on even to Blackett. I mean, Blackett's 25 paper was called the, the, the ejection of protons from, from nitrogen, isn't it? No, no, I, I mean, to me, it was all over in, in the oh, you know, 1919 and 20 time. It was in 1920 that at the Bankeria lecture, Rutherford suggested there had to be a neutral particle of the same mass. <coughs> As a, as a proton, if you were going to account for isotopes. And in that same talk, he started building up atoms, proton, uh, that was hydrogen, helium, uh, with two protons and two neutrons, and so on. Up. So he started to build up atoms that way. But a lot of the bits and pieces weren't known to explain isotopes at that time. And it took uh, from when he predicted 1920, it took 12 years before a, neutro uh, a neutron was discovered. And Chadwick kicked himself because uh, he knew about Rutherford's prediction from there. And when they were doing counting experiments, the dark room, wait for your eyes to darken that to talk about all sorts of things. And one was Rutherford told him that it's, it's uh, a neutron, it's uncharged, it would be very hard to detect. And Chadwick had picked up on that. Um, and they've done the old experiment looking for it. But never the right one. Can I just say, I mean, if there is a fusion of the alpha particle with the, um, the nitrogen nucleus and the proton coming off, you would get oxygen 17, wouldn't you? Did you get a. Yeah. Uh, so is there any, any it way of nice. acting by, um, you know, Magnetic field, electric field, to see from that normal uh, oxygen as well. Mm -hmm. Now, can, can, could you have detected the fact that there is this oxygen? Uh, no. These were just individual particles, yeah. and for any chemistry, they, you needed billions of particles to detect. So that, that's why it had to be by imaging whatever was happening mm -hmm. in this one. Can I ask you another question based on what he says in the paper? At the very end, he says, these results as a whole suggest that if alpha particles or similar projectiles of still greater energy were available for an experiment, we might expect to break down the nuclear stru nucleus structure of many of the lighter atoms. Was he then thinking about going to Cambridge and building accelerators? 
that's the bit I had to cut out of the talk. <laughs> 20 minutes, I could put it back in. But, because that's another real interesting one, where the base of it started in Canada. The copper problem. But it's quite not. But you're thinking he, he was thinking about acceleration. Well, I, I don't think in that, at that time there was a technology for acceleration, was there? No. He, he, that, he, the, he thought about it. I mean, he thought about what he wanted to do. He wanted to get high voltages, didn't he? There were times when he, he, he aimed for higher. He worked out the voltages that he yeah. needed, and they were enormous, right? Well, well in 1919, he knew he had uh, 10 million electron volt alphas. Yeah. yeah. And so you had to have 10 million electron volts. <coughs> yeah. um, that was after the question. A, 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 quick, a quick pressure. But the copper he, he had one. used half a megavolt. No, yeah, but hang on, you had to get there. Yeah. Uh, he was quite convinced you needed 10 million. He, he, in Canada, knew that if you could have uh, accelerated particles, you would have an incredibly higher flux than you could possibly get from natural gravity. Mm -hmm. Or millions. And so he was always driving towards that. And in the 20s, he spent this time exhorting uh, British industry to go to higher and higher voltages. They could only go to half a million electron volts. Um, and that was for very high energy, DC. That was for very high energy um, x rays for examining welds and structures that were under high, really high pressure, uh, gas boilers, uh, you know, steam boilers, and oil pipelines, things like that. And he was always driving the industry to go higher and higher. But I came from a, a funny way, a fellow George Gamoff. I'll just backtrack. When Rutherford was in Canada, he had made many measurements, and one of them was every known L3 emitter, and there weren't all that many of them at that stage to sort it out. And he looked at the energy of the alpha particle released, and he looked at the half life. And he published a table where uh, the energy of the alpha particle was increasing. Now, the alpha particle only increased by a factor of two. But in the table of the, the, um, the half-life, the lowest energy alpha particle had come from something that had a half-life of uh, the age of the universe, billions of years. And by the time you we went from billions of years, thousands of years, hundreds of years, a few years, a few minutes, just from that change of two. And I was telling them something, I mean, these days, absolutely crucial, but no one had any idea whatsoever it was. And when he first came to Manchester, he got Geiger and his student, Nuttall, to repeat this with, you know, slightly better radioactive materials, slightly purer, better measurements, and so on. And they, instead of producing a table like that, they produced a long log graph, it was a straight line. And that was the famous Geiger Nuttall, which Rutherford had already um, published in Canada. But again, he, he never claimed anything. You know, he never took stuff away from his collaborators. And that existed to be explained away for two decades. Um, until a fellow get George Gamow applied quantum mechanics to the problem is how does an alpha particle get out of the nucleus? It doesn't have to have this incredibly high energy to jump over the barrier, but if the barrier is thin enough, it can tunnel through. And just a small change in the width of this barrier increases enormously the probability of coming out and therefore cuts down the half-life. And he had the guy in the wall as immediate proof that this theory was correct. And then two months later, um, Gamow gave a talk in Cambridge on the reverse problem. You could fire an alpha particle at an atom. And it didn't have to jump over this enormous barrier, it could tunnel through. And you could affect it. 
um, with much lower values than naturally occurring ones. And we had a high voltage specialist working with him, John Cockcroft, who quickly worked out that even at 500,000 volts, which, which industry could do, you would still get a, a, a good flux in and motor. Okay, very, very yeah. quick final question. Isn't it true that actually uh, George Gamow had, had realised this and was telling Rutherford that this was the case repetitively and that the, the guys Cockcroft and Walton in the lab in Cambridge were not really doing very much. And at the same time Gamow had also been to Kharkov in the Ukraine and there they had a similar setup but they didn't actually do the experiment and suddenly, all of a sudden, Rutherford went down to the lab in the sense of realising with Gamma it was urgency and they did the experiment, got the tunneling, much lower energy, right. transmutation. Well, that, that's roughly true, but there are different reasons for each one of those things. Yeah, yeah, but it was all quite, as in all these things, it's quite complicated the way it works, but the basic mechanism was the quantum mechanical tunneling, which George Gamma... No, no, it was, it was George Gamma was going to talk there and Rutherford wasn't a great fan of theory, but with the, um, if someone explains something so long and un unexplained like the guy going nut on the wall, uh, then he was a fan of it. And when he was told, yeah, yeah you should be able to get <coughs> on the I don't disagree with anything you've said. No, 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 but the, uh, mm -hmm. Walton was the key one on the accelerator. So yeah. Uh, he had worked for a year, he had arrived at the campus year before with a, the idea of how one could accelerate electrons using a <coughs> sharp discharge to get these high voltages and that impressed Rutherford and he showed them how his would work but they could modify it maybe he would spent a year working this and it never actually worked and it was just the time when Cockroft came, um, Gamow came along Cockroft was there as a high voltage species and he worked out what would happen and rather put Walton and Cockcroft on the building and accelerator. Now, the final bit at the end, yeah, they were, they were all here. Uh, spitting and polishing and making it better and testing things, because it was really high, difficult stuff. It was incredibly high voltage from the time. But Rutherford had a talk coming up at the raw side on the structure of the nucleus. And he went into the lab and told them to stop messing about it <laughs> and use the rather than improve on it. That talk was two weeks later. So, uh, and they did it in that following week. Yeah. Hmm. But all the time, Lawrence could have done an experiment with his cyclotron. Yep, and didn't. Uh, so well, I know the way scheme we heard about rather than the <laughs> copper report. Yeah. And said, so, come on, we get back to the lab. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Quick announcement. Um, we've got uh, a tour coming up. Um, because there are so many of you, I'm going to split into two. So, uh, can I suggest that um, roughly, okay, we've got lunch now till 1 30. Uh, everybody behind this stage uh, come and meet me at 1 30 down in, in the foyer. Okay, and then at 2 15, everybody on this bench uh, joins me in the foyer. Does that make sense? Yeah.